Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today um, for this important and timely discussion on campaign finance reform. My name is Lindsay Langholz. I'm a director of policy and program at the American Constitution Society. For those of you who don't know us, ACS is a diverse national network with over 200 student and lawyer chapters in almost every state and on most law school campuses. Our members are lawyers, law students, judges, policy experts, legislators, and legal academics who are committed to upholding the United States Constitution in the 21st century by working to ensure that the law is a force for improving people's lives. Next Tuesday marks 10 years since the Supreme Court released its decision in Citizens United. In those 10 years, super PACs have emerged as a major player in the political arena, and independent expenditures have skyrocketed at the federal, state, and local levels. The FEC now lacks a quorum and any ability to enforce federal campaign finance law. As everyone in this room surely knows, 2020 is an election year, and fears about foreign interference and public corruption abound. What could go wrong? To discuss our current situation we, um, and what we should be doing about it, we have a distinguished panel of experts. Our moderator, Michael Tomaski, is the editor of Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, is a columnist with The Daily Beast, a contributing opinion writer for The New York Times, and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He appears frequently on radio and television to discuss current events and is the author of five books, most recently last year's If We Can Keep It, How the Republic Collapsed, and How It Can Be Saved, which is due out this June in paperback, so get your copies. Michael moderated a panel for ACS at our 2012 National Convention, marking the two-year anniversary of Citizens United, and we're delighted that he is with us again today. Please join me in welcoming Michael Tomaski. <clears throat> thank you, Lindsay. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> that was eight years ago, was it? Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned that the paperback is due out in June. That's not too far away. Please put that in your Google calendars. You won't want to miss that. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to do this, um, and I want to learn some things from this august quadrumvirate, as I'm sure you all do, uh, and I think they'll teach us a lot. So uh, it's going to be the usual format. Um, I think we'll just go down the row here uh, from my left to my uh, physical, if not metaphorical, far left. and. Um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, everybody will do a sort of five, six, seven minute, you know, your general uh, assessment of where we are here at this, uh, at this 10 year anniversary. Uh, I'll give brief introductions to everybody. I think you have the material, but I'll just, uh, and I'll not read these entire bios, but just as each person speaks, I think I'll just highlight a couple of things. Chi Sun Lee uh, is very distinguished. Uh, 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 you're not senior counsel anymore. You just got a promotion, isn't that correct? Aye. Yes, deputy. Yeah. Deputy director. Deputy right. director uh, uh, at the Brennan Center for Justice, which we all know is a great institution, led by my friend Michael Waldman. They do tremendous things, and um, and she uh, works on. Um, uh, she's also a, a, an adjunct professor at the NYU School of Law, uh, and uh, she uh, has been uh, done projects for ProPublica and is pu published in the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, National Law Journal, PBS Frontline. Uh, her most illustrious uh, sentence in her bio, as far as I'm concerned, is the one that mentions the Village Voice, because that's where I used to work, too, some years ago. Uh, we did not cross I paths. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. We did not most exactly. Fun job I ever yeah, had. Yeah. My, uh, I could probably say the same. Uh, we did not exactly cross pa paths then, although I, I still suspect we may have uh, uh, in New York City politics in the late 1990s. But anyway, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. So Ji Sun, would you start us off with your uh, reflections on this anniversary? Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you so much to American Constitution Society for bringing us together, because there's nothing else going on in this town. So like, what else would we be talking about or thinking about right now if not for the impact of Citizens United on our elections? Um, I want to, I'll keep it brief right now because there's a lot more to learn from my fellow panelists. Uh, but I'll just start off by saying that um, I'm here with very bad news and good news from the Brennan Center. Uh, 
my colleagues just put out a uh, jaw-dropping analysis, which is, it's hard for me to be shocked, but trying to quantify what's been the impact of Citizens United on election giving. Um, you, you know, the, the news, political journalists, forgive me, Michael, have really caught on to this narrative that there's a huge wave of small donors. We haven't needed any reforms. Things are deregulated, but small donors are still fighting back, and they're really driving elections, and so probably we're okay. When you actually look at the numbers, it turns out that in the most recent midterm and presidential election cycles, the opposite is true. Yes, small donors are surging. There are many more of them than ever before. They're giving more than ever before. But in the 2018 cycle, just 3,500 donors who gave 100,000 or more outgave all 7 million small donors who defined as giving 200 or less. And in the last presidential cycle, the trend is similarly uh, alarming, where you had 400 people giving a million dollars or more to federal campaigns or super PACs that participated in federal elections. Um, 400 people who gave a million or more, far outspending five million small donors. So the giving is increasing from all quarters, but the very, very wealthy who are capable of giving enormous amounts are far outstripping the small donors. And this is a crisis in a democracy um, that is not supposed to be driven by wealth. Um, so that's the really bad news that we learned this week. The good news is that, um, you know, and, this, and we'll talk a lot more about this, I'm sure, but the effect of Citizens United and Supreme Court jurisprudence and governing law is our options are constrained. Um, but there's one policy that is fully available and has been growing all over the country. And at the Brennan Center, I've been leading its, uh, its growth and, and uh, adoption in New York State, and that's what we call small donor public financing, which is a really jargony way of saying um, under even the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, under the law that governs us in campaign finance reform, it's possible still to construct smart, um, fiscally responsible policies that will take, that will use public money to amplify the voices and donations from small donors to candidates who volunteer to opt in and usually agree to certain conditions um, at, in return for being able to participate in this democracy enhancing reform. And since Citizens United, you know, recognizing that something has to happen, but certain things are no longer possible, um, like limiting corporate spending, uh, more than a dozen places around the country have enacted some shape or form of public financing, and the biggest by far um, just very recently was in New York State where um, a, a program created by appointees of the governor and legislators created a, uh, will apply to all the statewide offices, including governor and the state legislature in a state with, um, that had sky high contribution limits and where big donors, it was just a given that big donors um, controlled the agenda in Albany. So that's just happened and we're really excited to see where that goes. And I'm gonna stop right there and pass the mic to Michael. Yeah. Just, uh, just a quick introduction. So Jason Abel is next. Jason is a partner at Steptoe and he leads Steptoe's political law and campaign finance practice and advises clients on a range of government affairs issues. He once worked for uh, Charles Schumer. You know who that is? And he was just telling me that um, before we started the panel that he was working for Chuck uh, on the very day, he recalls working for him on the very day that the Citizens United decision came down and what the reaction was like in that office. So we might be interested in hearing a few seconds of that, but um, the floor, sir, is yours. Great, thank you. And thanks, Michael, and thanks to ACS for the invitation. Um, it's funny, I, you know, 
I remember last year thinking, wow, it's been nine years since, since, since United. And I don't know, there's been some other stuff going on, right? So I didn't even realize it was 10 years until we got the email. And it has been a long and interesting 10 years. Um, as Michael said, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I was a lot younger. Uh, and I was working for uh, a very shy member of Congress, uh, minority leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, what I say, obviously, it's not on behalf of him. This is you know, your standard disclaimer. This is my own personal opinion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, uh, Chuck was uh, chairman of the Senate Rules Committee. And I was fortunate to serve as his chief counsel in that role uh, on that fateful morning when Citizens United was decided. Uh, we knew it was going to be big, uh, especially after the rehearing and all the buildup. And you know, we, we sort of knew a big opinion was coming down. Uh, after it came down and we quickly read it, uh, it was bigger than we thought. And you know, there was a lot of talk in the hours and the days afterwards that this is going to unleash corporate and union money into the system, and it's going to really reshape how we look at campaign finance. And there were, you know, those friends that said, "No, no, no, you're, the sky isn't falling. Everything's going to be just the same." And I think you look at it ten years later, and while we somewhat still have a sky, uh, it really did usher in a brand new era of campaign finance. Um, I think it still creates a lot of confusion. Uh, what exactly did Citizens United do and what didn't it do? Uh, but in those days afterwards, we were tasked with trying to find a legislative response. Um, if you think back to those days, uh, we had, we being the Democrats, I am a Democrat, I know that surprises you all, um, we had 59 senators. We had control of the House. There was a Democrat in the Oval Office. Uh, I, I know ACS has done other congressional reform panels, so we can spend many times talking about the filibuster and the cloture vote. We'll put that aside. Uh, but that wasn't enough. Uh, those margins in Congress was not enough to get any legislative reform passed. Um, we worked on the Disclose Act, uh, which had a snappy acronym. That might be my only claim to fame when everything is said and done. Um, that was you? Yes, nice. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, democracy, um, uh, well, what, what is it? <laughs> democracy is strengthened by casting light on spending in elections act. Okay. I see, I had, I, you know, it didn't start with disclose, it started with democracy as, as, it, as it should. And there was some fancy, you know, you capitalize the O, but not, you know, the I and N, but um, uh, it, it it was an interesting time to try to get something passed. Um, you know, popular. Um, you know, contrary to popular belief, uh, it was there was a pretty strong attempt for it to be bipartisan. Uh, there was a significant amount of outreach to then Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown, also to Olympia Snow, uh, to try to get something done. Uh, you know, nowadays. You're, you're not even close to bipartisan campaign finance reform. And I think as a result, what you see is, well, at some point looking to the FEC, and we'll discuss that uh, as well, but also looking to the states and figuring out where can the states and where can localities come in in an attempt to somewhat uh, uh, restrain the money in, in politics. Or, on the other hand, increase disclosure in politics. So we know exactly where the money is coming from. We know exactly who is spending what on our, on our elections. Uh, but th with that dim projection aside, I, when, when I teach this, I have a, a, a slide. And it's you know, the prospects of campaign finance reform. And you know, it's trying to be funny. And you know, it's a, a pig with wings. You know, it's a, a, like a city you know, a nameplate that says hell that's frozen over. Uh, but then the last icon, and I'm from Chicago, so I can do this, was, you know, uh, Cubs win the World Series. <laughs> so that clearly happened. So maybe there is some prospects there. I had to delete that from the, from the PowerPoint. Uh, but, you know, I think that going forward and looking at what we're going to see over the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, um, I, I think that barring a major, you know, shift in federal policy, Politics. I think we're going to have to look to you know states and localities to see what additional types of policies that they can put in place. So. Thanks. 
Uh, Chiara Torres Spellacy is professor of law at Stetson University. Stetson University is in Florida, isn't that mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, uh, and she is also, look at that, a Brennan Center fellow. So we have Brennan Center amply represented. Uh, she was a counsel to the democracy program at the Brennan Center, uh, associate at Arnold and Porter. She has uh, written for the Washington Post, New York Times, Slate, LA Times, The Atlantic, a whole bunch of places, arguably more than I have. And uh, she's uh, <clears throat> an author of uh, at least a couple of books, one of which is called Political Brands, which maybe we'll hear about for a minute or two. Uh, uh, so, Chiara, thank you for coming, and it's all yours. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chiara Torres Spellacy, and my dad was an artist and a really uh, creative thinker. And when I was a, a youngster, he would tell me, Chara, remember to ask the big questions. And the big question that I've been asking for about a decade now is what's the proper role of corporate money in a democracy? And that was the topic of my first book, and it's the topic of this book, too. Uh, so before I was an election lawyer, I was a corporate lawyer at Arnold and Porter. And I left uh, corporate law running. I hated every minute of it. Uh, but when Citizens United showed up at the doorstep of the Supreme Court, I had to dust off my corporate skills and think about how this decision might impact the rights of shareholders. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Brennan Center um, talking about the corporate governance problems that Citizens United write, uh, creates, and that piece um, is something that I sort of, I'm like, we still have these problems. So basically the two big problems I identified there was a lack of transparency and a lack of consent. So the transparency problem is sometimes known as the dark money problem, where uh, there's spending in politics and you can't trace it to the original source, whether that original source is an individual or a corporation. And then the consent problem is American shareholders in contrast to their peers over in England. So in England, in the UK, uh, shareholders can vote on future political budgets for corporations. And American shareholders, or shareholders in American companies, don't have that same ability to consent. So I spent the past 10 years working on corporate and securities laws, uh, solutions to Citizens United. I worked on the Disclose Act. I also worked on the Shareholder Protection Act, which would have given American shareholders consent. Um, both of those uh, legislation in slightly different form uh, passed in HR 1, uh, but that is sort of dead on arrival on Mitch McConnell's desk right now. Uh, the other place that I have pushed for changes is at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we asked the Securities and Exchange Commission to do an anti-dark money rule for publicly traded corporations. Uh, we had a million people write into the Securities and Exchange Commission asking for that rule, but we could never convince Mary Jo White, who was a Democrat, uh, to actually do the rule. And then, <laughs> Even worse than that, in some ways, Mitch McConnell, sort of his light bulb went on, and he has been putting writers into the federal budget, which say to the Securities and Exchange Commission, you can't write a dark money rule. So, and he, he did that like two, like uh, two weeks ago in, the, in our current federal budget. Um, and that got zero press. And there is this ongoing fight at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, they have a new proposed rule that got proposed right as impeachment was heating up. And uh, the good news is you have until February 3rd if you'd like to comment at the SEC. And here, here's the, the file number that you have to reference. <laughs> S7-23-19. S7-23-19. And what this rule proposes to do sounds really benign. They are changing who is qualified as a shareholder to put in shareholder proposals on a corporate proxy. And that sounds like snooze fest. 
But the reason why that matters is over the past decade, shareholders have been using their rights under the securities laws to ask companies to be more transparent about where they are spending money in politics. And today, 314 companies have decided to be transparent. And that is a far larger number than the day that Citizens United was decided. But if they get this rule change, only uh, shareholders who have a, a much bigger holding will be able to put those shareholder proposals in, or shareholders have to hold it not just for one year, which is the current rule, they'll have to hold it for three years. So I'd encourage you, if you want an action item, like I hate Citizens United, what can I do? Write to the Securities and Exchange Commission and reference S7-2319. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. Lee Goodman is a partner <clears throat> at Wiley Ryan, uh, where he works on a broad range of policy-oriented subjects, including federal and state campaign finance and ethics laws, First Amendment rights of political speech and association, political action on the Internet, and so on. He uh, was... Uh, a Republican appointed chairman and commissioner of the Federal Election Commission uh, at the time Citizens United was decided or right after? Uh, I was appointed in 2013. Okay, so shortly, not, not too long after. Uh, uh, dealing, in other words, with its aftermath. Uh, and uh, uh, named a top campaign and elections lawyer by Washingtonian and Republican Lawyer of the Year by the Republican National Lawyers Association in 2019, just last year. How about that? Uh, Lee, welcome. Uh, I imagine what you have to say might be a little bit different from what we've heard so far. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's important that we have these discussions uh, and that we engage each other. And uh, I, I guess uh, I wanted to start, since the uh, setup of this was you know, 10 years hence, you know, uh, where are we? And I think it's important that we, uh, there are real serious issues in the aftermath of Citizens United and how we grapple with uh, transparency, how we grapple with uh, the definition of corruption, how we grapple uh, with uh, foreign money coming through entities. And those are real issues that we need to discuss. Uh, but I also think that we ought to not have that discussion in some hyperbolic vacuum. We ought to at least understand the uh, meets and bounds or the scope uh, of the issues and the uh, spending that has resulted from Citizens United over the last 10 years. And the statistics uh, are uh, actually, I think, begin to cabin this issue uh, as a smaller issue uh, uh, by comparison to all of the very large debate we have about the problems of Citizens United. Because at its core, what Citizens United changed in the law was that it allowed incorporated associations, nonprofit associations, labor unions, business corporations, to make uh, independent expenditures to say vote for or against uh, certain candidates. Uh, and, and so how big has that problem become? Because you know, the concern is that uh, large corporations are gonna overwhelm the democracy uh, to the extent that uh, average everyday people uh, don't have a say in their in their democracy, or at least a relative say in their uh, in their campaigns and elections, and so when you look at the uh, so-called uh, dark money issue, which is a nonprofit spending, um, a lot of the nonprofits that are spending are uh, uh, labor unions, uh, and the total. Uh, percentage of all the expenditures in the campaign cycles we've seen since Citizens United, the nonprofits that are spending, uh, that is incorporated nonprofits, has been about 2.5 to 5 percent depending on how you calculate that number. If you look at the super PAC spending, uh, uh, the studies show that only about 5 or 6 percent of contributions to the super PACs are coming from business corporations. And of that 5 or 6 percent, uh, about 80 percent is from small corporations, meaning um, small private corporations, not uh, publicly traded corporations. And many of the efforts uh, at uh, blunting or cabining the effects of Citizens United are focused on um, the publicly traded corporations, 
they are uh, 80% of, um, I mean, sorry, they are about, uh, uh, they're a very small amount of the total spending in elections. So when we talk about whether or not business corporations, because a lot of the debate is you know, uh, focused on business corporations, the labor unions don't seem to um, upset people in their spending, and a lot of nonprofit organizations, particularly if you agree with their cause, don't seem to upset a lot of the criticisms or critics of Citizens United. And so I just think it's important that we keep in mind that we're talking about probably uh, well less than two or three percent of total spending in election cycles are is coming from money utilizing the right recognized in Citizens United for incorporated entities, particularly business corporations, to spend money to influence elections. Uh, another comment uh, or observation I think we ought to keep in mind is even utilizing uh, the right of super PACs to associate. It's not a, a if 80% if of the money is actually coming from individuals, wealthy individuals, albeit, wealthy individuals had a right to spend unlimited resources, personal resources, uh, in American politics and elections for all but two years. And that was 1974 to 1976. The amendments of 1974 put limits on expenditures, and in 1976, the Supreme Court in Buckley v. Vallejo said that you cannot restrict an individual from utilizing their own resources to influence elections. And so uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, right of wealthy individuals to make independent expenditures has been a, a, a First Amendment right for a long time, and Citizens United didn't affect that. In fact, in a Supreme Court decision, Massachusetts Citizens for Life, uh, the Supreme Court recognized the right of nonprofit organizations, which you might call dark money organizations, to make unlimited independent expenditures so long as they took in money only from individual donors, even wealthy individual donors. And so what we're seeing now is we're seeing super PACs, 80% funded by individuals, not uh, incorporated entities, and so what we're really seeing is a sort of a rejuvenation of the old MCFL uh, uh, function or uh, entity that sat in the FEC's regulations for a long time and was largely underutilized. Now we have this thing called super PACs, and they're not much different from what the Supreme Court recognized in the late 1980s, these uh, nonprofits that are funded by individuals. And the statistics are that uh, most of the money is coming from these individuals. One other observation I'd like to make, here we are 10 years after Citizens United, um, is that the left and the right in the uh, political debate have been largely competitive in how much money they've raised and spent and the communications they've made uh, utilizing the uh, super PAC entity and in the nonprofit uh, world. And so if you're concerned, really, if your concern is really that large business corporations and capitalists were going to steal the public dialogue, they haven't done so. And uh, because the left has had its stalwart defenders and funders as well, and they've been largely competitive. In some cycles, the left has preferred the super PAC, or the right has preferred the nonprofit. But when you look at that in aggregate, it has been competitive. Um, so there are a lot of other issues we can debate, the, the micro issues of corruption and influence and transparency. But I think it's important that we understand uh, Citizens United in context 10 years hence. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll toss a question at everyone, and uh, and then maybe you know you can have toss questions at one another, and and we'll go at it, and then soon enough it will be your turn. So Lee, let's let's start with you, and then work back down. And um, uh, <clears throat> you are, of course, the uh, you know we we appreciate you coming today to offer your perspective. Um, <clears throat> uh, if it's any comfort to you, I have on many occasions been the token liberal at conservative gatherings and, uh, you know, been <laughs> been looked at in that way uh, and uh, so on. But people were always very courteous to me, so we'll be certainly courteous to you. But I do wonder, um, and probably everybody here wonders, like, 
Well, one, it's it's a fair point that uh, conservative money and liberal money is more balanced than um, <clears throat> some people might think. Uh, but I think the critique of a lot of people would be that the money uh, has distorted the system to such an extent that the political process really represents the views, not, I, w I would not say of the 1%, I think that's an exaggeration, but represents the political views of the 5% or the 8% uh, and not really the people. And you know, if we had four hours, I could tick down issue after issue after issue where <clears throat> public opinion, uh, uh, a majority of public opinion clearly wants A, B, C, D, public policy outcome, uh, but those outcomes are simply impossible, and they're rendered impossible, I think a lot of people would say, because of the domination of money in the system, and that is not solely a Republican problem, that's sometimes a Democratic problem. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what's your response to that? I mean, do you think, are things just fine the way they are? There are a lot of different ways to begin addressing that. that that's a big one. <laughs> right. Let me start with this. Um, problems in uh, representative democracy and getting the results that you want are not just a problem of speech and the amount of speech being funded in, in the process. Because who gets elected? and uh, the positions they take, and uh, the makeup of the House and the Senate, and indeed the White House, uh, and the positions taken out of those institutions uh, cannot be explained just be by the amount of money in the process. And if the left and the right are competitive in their speech, then you would think the amount doesn't really matter because whether whether uh, I'm being bombarded with uh, 10 ads from the left and 10 ads from the right or 100, that's really all you're doing. You're ratcheting up the amount of speech that people hear. Um, the outcomes in policy are uh, a very uh, impacted by a, a very dynamic set of circumstances. Uh, national issues, national circumstances, national scandals, uh, redistricting, uh, gerrymandering, uh, um, the uh, partisan identification of voters, and trying to isolate that there's too much speech being funded, uh, I think uh, probably uh, understates or oversimplifies the issue of, of paralysis in our political process and what have you. Um, and certainly the, um, the paralysis we see today in Washington, D.C. is, I don't think, any, in, in any way a function of Citizens United or too much money in the system. I mean, we have a president uh, who, uh, who is polarizing, and he, he spent far less money and had less money spent on his behalf than his opponent. So I, I don't think you can lay uh, the current problems we face at the hands of Citizens United or too much money in the in the system, and again, only about 5% of the money is uh, this so-called uh, dark money. So the other thing, the other observation that I would make is if speech is competitive, regardless of whether it's $10 or $1,000, but speech is largely competitive, what we are talking about at the end of the day, and this is why I'm a libertarian in this, in this field, I'm not here defending the Second Amendment and guns. Guns might kill somebody. I'm defending the First Amendment and words and the ideas those words express. And to say uh, there's too much money in the system is to say, well, there are too many words being expressed and too many ideas uh, being debated uh, in a way that distorts not necessarily the politician, but might distort the people who hear that speech. A politician is not going to take official action on speech that is irrelevant, does not resonate, 
uh, or uh, that is not, does not influence public opinion. And so what you're ultimately seeing is speech that influences the people and public opinion, and only when speech influences public opinion does it then influence official governmental action. And so there's a chain of causation here, but you have to understand speech itself doesn't necessarily influence the politician. It goes through the intermediate step of influencing public opinion. And so what you're ultimately indicting in, in, that, in the analysis that, that you presented was uh, there's too much money funding too much speech influencing too many people, which then causes politicians to take positions that uh, uh, we don't like. And how that gets translated through a representative body has as much to do with party identification and uh, redistricting, probably, than it does the money spent in these elections. I'm curious if anyone else up here wants to yeah. comment on this set of issues, which is really at the heart of it about money and representative democracy. So, Sure. Um, so if we're looking 10 years uh, in the past, uh, over that decade, we've had a billion dollars of dark money spent in federal elections alone. And you're right, it is around 5%, but only in my crazy world of money and politics is $1 billion also equal to only 5% of a bigger number. Um, and because it's dark, we don't know if the original source uh, were publicly traded corporations, unions, uh, rich individuals, or foreign individuals. And um, if we're bringing in uh, current events, I think of Lev Parnas as the product of our deregulated campaign finance system. He took a risk that if he made a, a, basically a shell corporation and he had that shell corporation give to a super PAC, that that would not be scrutinized. Now he bet wrong, the SDNY was on to him and so now we know that at least a million dollars in his coffers was from a illegal foreign source. Now, if you'll remember, right after Citizens United, President Obama, in his State of the Union, warned America that the, the Citizens United decision could open the floodgates to corporate and foreign money. And you know, he even got a reaction out of uh, Justice Alito, who, who was in the audience, who mouthed the words, not true. Well, I think history has shown that Obama was right and Alito was wrong. Okay, let me switch it up a little bit and work back down. Jason, um, you talked about the Supreme Court. Uh, we all have to talk about the Supreme Court when we talk about this. What, what do you see coming down the road in terms of where the Supreme Court's direction is going to be on these kinds of issues? And what, you know, like I suspect that there will be a, a complete elimination of contribution limits one day. Um, do you see that, or what else do you see coming? Or are there, are there indeed specific yeah. cases in the pipeline on, that, that groups are trying to get the court to grant certiorari to here? So it, it's interesting. When we think of Citizens United, we think of you know, uh, corporate money in politics, right? We think about uh, you know, the idea that corporations are, are people. Right? I mean, I think that a lot of angst about that opinion is focused on that. But, you know, to, to get at your question, there, there really is an underlying issue with Citizens United that really isn't, you know, it hasn't really pierced the public consciousness in ways that you'd think. And that's how the court defines corruption. And that's extraordinarily important because that could determine what laws and what regulations survive and what get you know what get shot down. Um, and you know, in its opinion in Citizens United, the court actually overruled a, a prior case that talked that gave another rationale for why you can regulate the campaign finance system. Um, the court was very clear in Citizens United that really quid pro quo corruption or the appearance thereof is, is really the rationale for regulating campaign finance, right? We're not gonna talk about undue influence. We're not gonna talk about improper access. We're not gonna talk about aggregation of wealth in the system is all reasons for regulating our campaign finance system. And this idea, uh, you ask some, they say, well, this is just merely repeating which, what was said in Buckley. 
right? It was always about quid pro quo corruption. Uh, you ask others, including those that dissented in Citizens United, and they would say uh, they've, you know, the court in its opinion tightened the screws. It really now has only focused on quid pro quo corruption. Um, we've seen a snowball, right? This, you know, Citizens United didn't create super PACs, right? Uh, you know, there was speech now, and there were a couple of FEC opinions that sort of allowed super PACs to, to really exist as we see it today. Uh, but speech now built off this idea, if independent expenditures cannot corrupt, right, under this definition of, of corruption. Uh, we also see the Supreme Court, I think it was in 2014, in a case called McCutcheon, advance this idea of, well, what is corruption? What is corruption that you know, allows for there to be laws and, laws and regulations? So given this groundwork, I think it makes rationalizing and justifying and defending certain campaign finance regulations pretty hard. Right? I mean, if quid pro quo corruption is, is really, and this is, I'm not saying I support this argument that I'm about to make, but you know, the idea is, is the contributor and the candidate. So under that theory, it's gonna be a lot harder to defend contributors giving money to, let's say, the DNC or RNC. Because where's the quid pro quo corruption? There's no exchange of money to a candidate. So I think when we look at various limits, when we look at limits to the political parties, when we look at limits to political committees in general, I think that when those get challenged, and we've seen various challenges in the past, but as some of those challenges get more advanced, I think that under this doctrine, I think it's I'm not saying it's impossible, and I'm not predicting that these laws will be, these rules will be struck down, but I think it makes it just that much harder to defend. Jason, just uh, have at it. You know, I'm interested in your yeah, thoughts on sure. all these things. Well, well I'll pick up on, on what I hear in, in what Jason's saying, which I agree with. Um, an important point being that uh, you know, one of the faults of the Citizens United majority and in related decisions has been to look at political giving and spending divorced from reality in this purest vacuum. I mean, among other issues, the Citizens United majority just assumed that the unlimited spending that it was uh, permitting would operate somehow independent of any candidate, exist in a pure world of pure independent speech, which I also hear Lee talking about. If you read within the four corners of the opinion, this is the world um, that the majority is living in. And, uh, you know, we all know that that's not how it operates. The majority also assumed a world of effective enforcement where things like coordinating between unlimited super PACs and candidates who are regulated because they can be corrupted, uh, the, the majority assumed a world where there would be effective enforcement and people would know. They assumed there'd be transparency so we would all know what's going on and there would be an effective watchdog making sure that uh, unpermitted things were not going on, and this is not the reality that we live in. Um, but you know, w the Citizens United decision is what it is. It it constrains those of us working on campaign finance reform. Uh, I would agree with what Jason didn't fully say, but it's the the near future is not looking that rosy. Um, which is why, you know, we look to reforms that can happen in spite of Citizens United. Public financing, you know, it, it's not about equalizing the amount of spending because that's impossible for those of us who are small donors, but providing candidates who want an alternative the chance to run for office and compete on the support of uh, their constituents and creating some more choice and competition and possibility in a world where we're currently constrained by the laws that ha the, the law as it stands in, in the Citizens United era.
Uh, why don't we, uh, just a little thought experiment, and stay with you, Chi Sun, and work our way back down, because I think you'll all say things that Lee might want to respond to. But uh, just, you know, if you could wave a wand and, and develop a campaign finance regime that you thought was just and equitable and fair, uh, <clears throat> what would be the main salient points of that regime? That's an enormous question. So um, living by what I just suggested that we try to live and think in reality, um, I am going to talk about HR1, which is, Jason, it's the For the People Act, right? Yes, thank you. Um, and this, this post-dates you, but you, you, you have to keep track of this stuff. Um, and so, you know, the For the People Act that passed the House and is, as Chara pointed out, sitting on Senator McConnell's desk, um, contains a suite of reforms that would do a lot, even living in the world of Citizens United, to make things more for fair and equitable and transparent and competitive. There is a, a really exciting component that would bring um, Americans multiple match public financing, six to one match on small donations of 200 or less, and generate enough to fuel competitive campaigns. Um, and it is, it is a self-funding mechanism. I can talk about that later if anyone's curious. Um, and it has really important transparency um, advances that also address uh, a lot of the um, political disinformation that happens through digital platforms right now, which our federal laws and regulations are just, we're, they're just not up to date uh, for the era that we live in and the way that elections and politics play out right now. Um, so I, I will I'll stop there. So I'm biased or maybe still bitter. Um, if you look to titles two and three, of the Disclose Act of 2010, which I'm sure you all read this morning. Um, it, there was a pretty robust disclosure regime put in place there that would not have prevented anybody from making any contributions or spending any money. It just made certain that there was appropriate disclosures. It followed the money and followed the paper trail. Um, so I. I would look to those disclosure and also shareholder protection. That was Title III, uh, which was actually a bipartisan suggestion. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, but I would look to those types of pro-transparency regimes. And, and also, and I'm sure uh, Lee would be happy to comment on this, but there, there needs to be some FEC reforms. Um, you know, I think we can debate what is the right reform, uh, but I'd like to think that regardless of, you know, what aisle, Republican or Democrat, uh, you know, you, you want a fully functioning agency and you want one that, that cooperates and will have policy disagreements and even enforcement disagreements. But I think what we're seeing right now is pretty unsustainable. Um, so I, I would also, if I can wave that magic wand, I would try to figure out a way to, to, to really reform that agency in a way that, that, that works for all. So if I'm in magic wand land, um, I would change uh, US securities laws to fix the transparency and the consent problem. Um, and I'm not alone in wanting changes like this. Uh, if you're interested in this, I would look for writings of um, Justice Leo Strine. He just retired from being um, a Supreme Court justice on the Delaware Supreme Court. And he hates Citizens United possibly even more than I do. Um, the other thing, if you had a magic wand, uh, you could change the Constitution. And there's been this effort to amend the Constitution to say that corporations are not persons and uh, for the purposes of political spending, and that expenditure limits would then be constitutional. Uh, that is often referred to as the 28th Amendment effort, though because what Virginia did this week with the ERA, <laughs> maybe we'll have to change the name to the 29th Amendment. <laughs> um, just some general observations, I guess. Uh, 
uh, I've been largely, personally, this is not a group think, I, I've been largely agnostic about uh, public financing. Um, if, uh, if people want to appropriate money to spend uh, on their uh, democracy, and it's a voluntary opt-in, uh, I've never been opposed to the presidential financing system. Uh, some in some in my uh, general philosophical world are are deadly opposed to that, and I've been largely agnostic so long as it's a voluntary system and so long as people opt into to doing so, and so long as taxpayers, you know, want to fund that. Um, uh, the securities law issue, um, uh, it it has a reasonable ring to it. But you do need to understand the suspicion of corporatist, and that is that the uh, transparency laws that are going to open up all of the expenditures internally for contributions to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, or in other words, political spending isn't just a corporation's spending to say vote for or against Smith, but even contributions to organizations like the U.S. Chamber. Uh, the suspicion is that that proposal uh, is a proposal of ideological opponents of business corporations and capitalists in order to push them out of the public debate and ultimately to punish them if they do participate in the public debate and therefore to harm shareholder value, not to enhance shareholder value. And so there is that suspicion of that proposal, and somehow we need to reconcile that with the idea of that shareholders ought to have a say. Now, the law in the United States, going back 50 years, there are old cases about the delegated authorities that those who run corporations have to decide whether to make charitable contributions or not, whether to spend on advertising for goodwill for the company or not. Those, those historically, and courts have upheld, have been decisions of the management of the company. Um, and, uh, but, but it's a legitimate issue to discuss, the, uh, the, the issue that you raise, but, but you do have to grapple with what happens when a corporation spends money and therefore then face boycotts and protests from people who are not even shareholders, who just want to harm the shareholders of that company. As far as other reforms, um, uh, oh, as far as amending the First Amendment goes, the uh, proposals we've seen to amend the First Amendment in Congress aren't about Citizens United. No, the uh, amendment to amend the First Amendment is about undoing the whole paradigm of Buckley v. Vallejo and allowing the government to restrict all expenditures for speech, uh, regardless of who that is. And uh, to, uh, to, that is to reverse the uh, paradigm of Buckley v. Vallejo that the right to use your resources to buy speech uh, is a fundamental First Amendment right. And so uh, uh, if it were just Citizens United, it might have greater traction, but I think it's overshot a bit. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, FEC functionality, uh, we can have that discussion. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of statistics that go into that and comparisons of other agencies. Um, you know, the, the statistics that uh, largely go to the unsustainability of the way it is currently functioning largely focus on the number of 3-3 three, three vote divisions uh, on important substantive issues. Um, uh, the uh, courts uh, have taken note, and I've now been reversed, I think, in three cases uh, in federal courts. I think I still have been upheld in the majority of cases where I was challenged. I was once reversed by a federal court uh, for overregulating. Uh, and uh, so, um, but my point is the system does have a relief valve if you think there are too many 3-3 votes. Uh, the statistics run from 15, depending on what you count and how you count them and the methodology applied. The, the, uh, the, the three number of 3-3 votes on substantive issues within the commission breaks somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. The high water mark, I think, was a report by former Commissioner Rabble at about 30 percent. I took issue with her methodology. I uh, won't bore you with that, but uh, when Tom Wheeler was chairman of the FCC, every year he issued a report on votes, important votes taken at the uh, commission, and the number of three to two votes at the FCC under Tom Wheeler's chairmanship were about 26%. In fact, Republican senators were upset with the FCC 
uh, that 26% uh, of the major policy issues being decided on three two party line votes was excessive. <laughs> and so whether you think a 15 to 30% um, split on uh, important substantive issues is too great largely depends on whether you like the outcomes or not. And, uh, but I think uh, getting uh, bipartisan support of about 80% of what the commission does speaks pretty well for the bipartisan structure of the agency and the four vote requirement that, uh, that we currently have. Uh, I think the commission would have serious problems if uh, it was enforcing um, against one party during, um, uh, in an era when the White House appointed uh, the chairman of an odd number body, if that odd number starts disproportionately enforcing against one political party, then you're gonna have much larger problems of legitimacy. And if you compare that to FCC votes, you could see that. Um, as far as um, what uh, 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 the transparency issue that's been uh, raised, you know, I supported transparency as a commissioner by and large. However, I did think that transparency is an issue of line drawing and where you draw lines. And what's being debated uh, at uh, the uh, commission and in federal courts right now is where to draw those lines. And there must be a line drawn. There must be a, lawn, a line drawn between forcing or compelling exposure of American citizens when they associate and spend uh, for political purposes. Uh, it, there must be a line drawn between that that influences elections versus that that is policy-oriented and issue-oriented. Uh, because the First Amendment right of private association still exists in our law and is very important to all of us. And there is a demonstrable social cost if we draw the line so far that we start forcing nonprofit organizations like Planned Parenthood Action Fund to disclose all their donors just because they make one political expenditure. As far as uh, other reforms I would like to see, uh, we undertook, we had bipartisan support on the commission for uh, really opening up um, online uh, donation platforms, whether it's ActBlue, uh, any number of those, because we all supported uh, the use of the internet and the uh, facility of the internet to supercharge small dollar donations. We all supported that that was a by, and if you go, you can look at a series of advisory opinions from the commission from before my time and during my time where we had unanimous votes to open up these platforms. And Act Blue was one that got a, a couple of advisory opinions. And the other uh, area that was uh, one of my priorities that I was not successful at moving a bipartisan uh, group at the commission in support of, and that is deregulation where the commission can uh, and in Congress where uh, they really, after BICRA, have the, the, um, the main strings on it, and that is deregulation of the, of the political parties, and particularly the state and local political parties that have been largely neutered in the uh, political process. They've been pushed out of any relevant role in the political process uh, under the new definitions of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, or McCain-Feingold because it started regulating what they could do in terms of get out the vote drives uh, and what we called federal election activity. Uh, as a guy who was once uh, a general counsel of a state party and worked very closely with state and local political parties, I can tell you I, I've often referred to them as the motel sixes of political organizations. There's always a light on. There's always a local party that is willing to take volunteers and the type of populist political, and to facilitate the kind of populist political participation that I think everyone here supports. And uh, the, I, think, I think there is bipartisan consensus that BIC were overreached in pushing uh, effective political participation by state and local parties out of the political process. Okay, that's a lot. Um, Let's just uh, work back down this way. Uh, Jara, I would imagine you have something to say in response on the question of the SEC. Uh, Jason, I saw you writing. Chisun, I saw you thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why don't we just come back down this way, and then I guess it'll be about time uh, for your questions. So uh, I would just reiterate that uh, the fight over the legacy of Citizens United is a live one. And one of the fora uh, for that fight is the SEC. Um, 
it is not an accident that they are trying to change who can put in a shareholder proposal, which I know is a snooze fest. I, I'm nearly like putting myself into like a napping position when I talk about the Securities and Exchange Commission. But they are... No, no, the kind of people who come to this kind of thing, want, <laughs> I, I can promise you, want to hear about what the Securities and Exchange Commission has to do with this. So don't be shy. Okay. How about um, it? But I think it is entirely in response to shareholders speaking up for themselves over the past decade and insisting upon no dark money from the corporations that they invest in. That's how you got to over 300 firms being more transparent. And so now you see the pushback in this uh, proposed rulemaking. And again, if you want to uh, give a comment to the Securities and Exchange Commission, it's S7-23-19. Thanks. So, Something that Lee said was, was interesting, and I think completely accurate, uh, about the constitutional amendments. Um, and when I first got to Senator Schumer's office, uh, he had in the past worked with Senator Specter, who was then a Republican, uh, and I believe Fritz Hollings was, was on this as well. It was a bipartisan constitutional amendment, essentially to overrule Buckley. This is years before Citizens United, and I think that one of the issues, uh, again, I'm not taking issue with what Lee said on this, but I, I think that that is when people really look at our system today and when a lot of people look at what Citizens United said about independent expenditures and what can corrupt. And I think when they laugh at that, and I think some people laugh that, really, so a $3,000 check from me to a senator for her reelection that can corrupt because it's over the limit. But if I spent $10 million of my own money, put aside corporate spending, if I put $10 million of my own money into an independent expenditure for her reelection, that can't corrupt at all? And while, you know, and I mentioned it before, while Citizens United, I think, put a finer focus on this, that's, that's Buckley. That's Buckley v. Vallejo's distinction between an expenditure and a contribution. I mean, you, I could bore you, we all can bore you with the scrutiny and how the courts look at this, the difference between an expenditure and a contribution, but there is this distinction between actually turning money over in a contribution and spending it without passing it along. And I think that when you look at some of these magic wands, I think that you know some folks, while might be rightfully charged up about Citizens United, a lot of this comes decades earlier in, in Buckley. So I think that that's an important point to make. Whether that makes anything better here, that we're looking at even more entrenched problems or protections in our campaign finance system, I think is, you know, is, is something that, that, that should be pointed out. So I have um, uh, an observation and then an action item of my own. Uh, it was interesting to hear you, Lee, talk about the, what's, what's going on with state and local political parties right now. Because this issue came up um, during the, the effort we just worked on um, and succeeded in, with the exception of a local issue that I won't bore you with, um, in New York State to create a small donor public financing program. And there were some um, you know, activists involved who for legitimate reasons, wanted this program to tightly regulate uh, party money, donations to parties and what parties could do with that money, how much they could use. Um, and the Brennan Center had, you know, not the, the, the not sort of super popular position of pushing back a little bit on that because we'd been talking with the chair of one of the state's political parties and in our experience working in other states, hearing from the heads of state and local political parties, that they were getting essentially squeezed out of um, the political debate. But the, the universal um, complaint from them was that they were being squeezed out by independent expenditure groups, super PACs, that were able to, unlike they accept, I mean, the 
political party limits in New York are extremely high, but even to them, they were being outraised and outspent by state super PACs who faced no limits at all. And, you know, constraining political parties would only drive money to less um, publicly accountable institutions than the political parties. So that is, uh, I would say, the universal narrative we've heard from both sides of the aisle in terms of how the power of political parties has shrunk. And so I just put that out there as something that um, we have heard time and again as uh, perhaps an unintended consequence of the super PACs that we live with now, but something that even people at the top of political fundraising machines who are not opposed to big money, they want more big money, they struggle with. Um, and you know the Brennan Center has heard that, and so we've sort of revisited uh, pre-Citizens United positions on money to and out of political parties to work with candidates. Um, so that's that's one observation. I get my action item would be uh, for those who who want to do the biggest thing possible to improve the situation under the the um, Citizens United realm. I would say you know get engaged and encourage your uh, federal representatives to support the For the People Act. Um, the public financing component has been proven through experience and you know, sophisticated data modeling to be able to shift the share of giving that comes from regular working people who cannot give a million or a hundred thousand or ten thousand. It shifts the share that um, supports candidates really significantly toward regular people who give small donations of 200 or less. And you've, we've seen bits and pieces of how this can actually play out. In Seattle recently, it's a slightly different public financing program than in um, the congressional proposal right now. But um, you saw that publicly financed candidates to the city legislature there were being um, Oppose progressive candidate. I mean, I, I'm the Brennan Center's nonpartisan, so this is irrespective of what platform they were um, running on. But uh, Amazon and some other big corporations that have a major interest in Seattle were spending exorbitant amounts in super PAC money, independent expenditures, to try to influence the outcomes of these elections. Um, and the candidates who took public financing and were the subject of attack ads from these uh, multi-million dollar ad campaigns, prevailed in four out of six of those contests with, I, I haven't, I don't know the math myself, I'm just, it's safe to assume that they spent a fraction of, a small fraction of what was being spent against them. So public financing, it doesn't equalize things, no one pretends that, but um, if designed right, implemented right, and if, if these tough questions about political parties and such are thought through, it is one mode for, um, for sort of reviving and, and restoring democracy for people who can't play at that $100,000, million-dollar level. You ended that perfectly because it is exactly 20 till 2. And so the, I, do I keep trains running on time or what? Uh, do we have a microphone, Lindsay? For, for, yes, OK. Uh, yeah, can we? Um, I guess this gentleman in the Michigan hat, that's a Michigan M, is it? OK, very good. So my name is Steven Spitz, uh, and I want to direct this to Jason and the others who want to comment. Um, I like that you're from Chicago. I am as well. Um, I think you're also dead on that some of the most overlooked parts of Citizens United, and particularly McCutcheon, is the cramped definition of corruption. Uh, I live in Virginia. Dominion Energy, which everybody, most people in the state, it's a state regulated, supposedly state regulated monopoly, because of the amount of money they give to legislators, including my state senator, who's now the majority leader of the state senate, they uh, put through a bill in 2015 saying 
that they don't have to be regulated by the State Corporation Commission anymore for five years. In other words, this is really corrupt, that, that a state regulated monopoly gives enough money so that they can get a bill through that says that they don't have to be regulated. Uh, and I'd like people to comment on that kind of basic corruption and, and how we get around McCutcheon in particular. Uh, you know, Bob McDonald got off probably because of the McCutcheon analysis of corruption when in the Virginia way he took a lot of money that, uh, but they didn't say you didn't really quid pro quo it enough, even though it was by the jury's definition and the public's definition totally corrupt. Yeah, so I, I went to University of Illinois, but I'll answer your question anyways. Uh, Big Ten, you know, camaraderie. Um, so it, it's hard. We focus primarily on campaign finance today. Um, it is hard sometimes to separate campaign finance issues with other uh, uh, good government or functioning government issues. I think, you know, we talked about gerrymandering and, and districting, and that obviously is an issue as well. Uh, but when you combine campaign finance issues with, with lobbying issues, um, especially in a state, and I, I live in Virginia, where, I mean, there are no restrictions. Right, I mean, you know, corporations can spend, not just spend, corporations can give unlimited amounts. Individuals can give unlimited amounts, a very different structure than what we see on the federal level. Um, we, what we've seen is we've seen it actually turn into a policy issue, and I think you're, you're referring to uh, uh, your state senator. I mean, he had a pretty tough primary challenge last time around. Uh, he was successful, but, and that was part of the issue, it was the impact of Dominion, right? So on one hand, uh, you know, there are these policy choices that are now being put forth, you know, on campaign finance issues, on good government issues. We see it in the Democratic primary. Uh, you know, many of the candidates try to, you know, outflank one another on who's not going to take money from which type of contributor. Um, you know, it's it's hard. Um, personally, I think it's hard to look at corruption as just quid pro quo corruption. I think that if you look at some of the comments um, from, and I'll get partisan for a second, uh, some of the comments from those members that voted for the tax bill uh, that passed Congress, I think a couple years ago, uh, there was some discussion about not wanting to let donors down or how are we going to go to a fundraiser if not passing tax reform. Um, the Supreme Court's definition in Citizens United advanced by McCutcheon is that, yeah, that's not corruption, right? That's not quid pro quo. Uh, a more, I'm not even going to say expansive, but a different view of corruption is that's, that's undue influence. That, that, that should be corrupt. Um, where do we go from there? I don't know. Um, uh, just to be completely honest. I think that it does create issues in other aspects of the law. It's easy to combine things. I think that you have some laws that weren't tightly written. I mean, when you look at the McDonald case, I mean, yeah, the definition of official act was really sloppy, and that was a unanimous decision there. And, and that, that's what makes having these conversations, I think, tough, but also very important. Because I think that we can really isolate, well, where, where are some of the problems here? Do we have problems in our public corruption laws? Do we have problems, um, uh, you know, in our campaign finance system? And what's the solution? I mean, for corruption, it's, that one's, that one's difficult. Because you can't just legislate that really easily away. Can I add on to that? So fa <laughs> fans of the Supreme Court uh, narrowing uh, the definition of political corruption have one more thing to cheer about, which is the Kelly versus US case, which is pending before the Supreme Court right now. It's better known as the Bridgegate case. It, the oral argument was this week. It didn't go well for the people who hate corruption. Uh, and so that uh, narrowing that they did in Citizens United and in McCutcheon, they could build on that because they've been narrowing the definition of corruption not only in campaign finance cases but in white collar crime cases like uh, Governor uh, McDonald's case. So keep an eye on the Bridgegate case because they could do even more damage.
Hi, Nancy Morgan. I'm, I'm working with Steve. I'm in Virginia. I'm the coordinator of the American Promise chapter, and we're trying to get the, a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United, and I'm sure Sierra's. She mentioned that, and in, in fact, HGR2, which is a, a Deutsch bill, has 209 uh, people who have co-sponsored it. One Republican. And the, uh, the sister bill in the House is the Udall, Udall bill, which has 46 sponsors. Our role is to get states to support these bills, and, and to date, 20 states have already uh, passed resolutions saying they want it, and most recently, New Hampshire. They spent five years, thousands of people, they got 80 cities and counties to pass resolutions. They finally got their legislator. Five of the resolutions are binding, linked to a citizen's uh, 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 Article 5 convention. And in Virginia, just in follow-up, because you mentioned the state issues, and in fact, Virginia is the only state where I could hand Stephen, if he's running for election, a million dollars, and he could turn around and buy a house with it. So in fact, there are, there are last year, 10, uh, 10 campaign finance bills were introduced. They all died. This year, they're just in the process of discussing them. There are like six bills, which were limitations on campaign finance banning prohibitions from um, state-regulated monopolies, disclosure laws, uh, restricting personal use of campaign finance, and a, a small bill on public financing of elections. So the question that I have for you is, is okay, this whole idea of getting, uh, we could get, uh, maybe even you uh, in Wyoming, they just had, it went through this resolution, went through this, I think the Senate, and then it died in the House. So this is not a conservative versus liberal issue. 80% of Americans want this to happen. So the question that I have for you, is it possible to get a constitutional amendment sim you know, that would be passed, and what are the implications of that? And then, and the whole issue of campaign finance, say for example in Virginia, at what point does it run up against Citizens United? And I'd just like to end with this because you're a, cons you're a conservative, a libertarian, and I love John McCain, and I always have this picture that, where he said that 30 to 70 percent of time by legislators is spent on 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 getting money in politics, uh, getting money to to run. And American, the Americans are are disenchanted with government. So I think that this is this is the time. But the question is, how far can we go? Sorry, um, I think it's very tough to get a constitutional amendment passed. I just, I, I, I do, I'll, I'll take that part of the question. And um, in, in the days and months after Citizens United, uh, there was a lot of discussion about that being the appropriate legislative response. Um, and there was a lot of internal political discussions that we had about, you know, well, what's, what's, the, proper, what's the proper response? What's the, pop, the proper messaging? Um, I, I don't see a reason why you can't do multiple tracks. Uh, folks want to push for a, you know, a, an amendment to the Constitution about, you know, campaign finance. Uh, we can debate that, uh, debate the merits of that, but also work, you know, there are certain states like Virginia that absolutely need reform, a full stop. Um, you know, it's a system with, with very few rules there. Uh, where do those run afoul of Citizens United? I mean, I think to the extent they start trying to limit independent expenditures, uh, I think that, that there is probably the most direct way that Virginia can run a file. I don't believe there are any uh, uh, bills that have been proposed this session that would do that, uh, but that would be in my that would be the first thing that would come in my mind that that that's going to face that's going to face some issues. You might love that idea, but you universally, but that's going to face some some constitutional issues. On the constitutional effort, I guess I would remind us that because it's the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, it took decades to get that amendment done. Uh, and when it was voted on finally in the House, it, it passed the House by a margin of one vote that they needed. It passed the Senate by one vote that they needed. And when it was finally confirmed by the final state, which was Tennessee, it passed by one vote. So. It can seem impossible. I'm sure for most of the women who were suffragettes, it seemed impossible to amend the Constitution in that way. But they eventually succeeded. 
One vote by a young legislator who was forced to do so by his, his mother. mother. <laughs> uh, let's have shorter questions and shorter answers. We've got 10 minutes. I saw several hands up. So ma'am, can you, you just like decide? You know, uh... I have a very short question because it's not a Citizens United question. Um, and it's to Jason and Lee only because you guys have identified as partisan. And I don't want to bring the Brennan Center into that. Um, so what is your theory of democracy? Because Lee, what I hear you saying is if I have a megaphone that I bought for $20 and you're shouting with your voice and I win in debate, the megaphone had nothing to do with it. But then Jason, I see the Democratic Party on the other side have no problem putting at least one person on the debate the other night who clearly bought his way in. So it seems neither side really has a fundamental issue with money and politics. So what is, if you're talking to a fifth grader, uh, your theory of democracy and money representing the best you can from either side? I, I think the debate stage was wrong. I, I don't believe that you can, uh, I don't think you should be able to buy your way up there. Uh, and, and I think that there were other qualified candidates that should have been on that stage uh, and that were forced to drop out. Um, and I think that, that you have a, a, a difficult situation. I think there's going to be a lot of discussions afterwards about whether the debate was, was properly run. Um, my theory of democracy, uh, I think, somewhat aligns with, uh, and it's somewhat derided now, but what Justice Thurgood Marshall said in the Austin case. I don't believe that we can have uh, too much money that would distort our political process. I think an aggregation of wealth uh, is, is harmful to our democracy, uh, even if it is speech, even if it is buying a, a bigger megaphone uh, or, or bullhorn, I think that that is harmful. Um, Citizens United overruled that case. Uh, and that would be something that, you know, in, in a magic wand, I'd, I'd wish to see back. Yeah, uh, I start with a, from a fairly libertarian view of this. And uh, first, so, so the idea that uh, Americans can use their resources to speak and Americans' right to hear that speech is my North Star in my idea of democracy. Um, in the current federal law and in the proposals to amend the First Amendment, there is always a uh, provision that says the press will not be so limited. And I have never fully understood why uh, the press is accepted from all these other notions of uh, the use of your resources to speak. So for example, if I told the New York Times, you have all the free press rights in the world that you can exercise. Just You go at it, New York Times. But we can put a limit on how much you spend to cover the news and to editorialize on your editorial page. We can restrict how much you spend. That means we can restrict uh, the expense that you spend on your printing press and how much ink you buy and how much paper you buy and on your, uh, excuse me, your distribution system of your newspaper. So everyone says that in the First Amendment, the press has this unlimited First Amendment right. But when it comes to every other citizen who might not own the printing press but wants to rent the printing press, because that's what you do when you buy a 30-second TV ad or when you buy a half-page ad in the New York Times, you don't own the printing press, but you are renting it. And I've never appreciated that distinction that somehow, if I want to temporarily use the New York Times' printing press or CBS's um, distribution system and broadcast license, that's, or, or Twitter or Facebook's platform to run ads, that somehow I get lesser First Amendment rights. And I fundamentally trust the American people because American people choose when they are bombarded with those ads. And, and by the way, there is increasing evidence that the ads are less and less influential. But the American citizen chooses whether or not to listen to the ads, whether or not to be persuaded by the messages that they hear, 
and whether or not to vote, and whether or not to vote on the messages that whether it was large corporations or large labor unions or rich guys like Tom Steyer or, um, or the Mercers, you know, they, the American individual has the right to hear that speech and then to make a decision on how to vote. And since the American people still vote in our elections, I'm not concerned about the amount of speech and the bombardment of speech. And in fact, never before in the history of our democracy have we had so many avenues of speech. It's, it's a veritable cacophony of speech. And, uh, and yet people are self-selecting on what they want to read online and which sources they want to read and they're making up their own opinions and they're so voting. And I don't think that the American people need a high degree of paternalism to protect them from whether it is corporate funded speech or whether it is labor union funded speech or whether it is an individual billionaire's speech. Uh, I think that uh, the American people, I trust them fundamentally to decipher what resonates with them and what doesn't and then to vote. And because the people still vote, everything else is really secondary to that. that that's my f approach to this and why I take a fairly libertarian view of it. Let me add this. To me, uh, I, I, I've, we all speak on a lot of panels. In what, I, what I often hear is the corruption rationale is too narrow. So let's broaden it to broader influence philosophy. And now what we're hearing is, well, government should also get in the uh, business of um, moderating speech. I heard Senator Warner make this, uh, re these remarks about Section 230 and how if we required transparency of anyone who talks about any political subject online, they might moderate what they say because they have to put their names on it. So now moderate government policy to moderate public discourse is creeping into our parlance. Protecting the American people from disinformation, where government is going to have some rules about what is disinformation and what is not. Uh, my point is it's not gonna stop at corruption. And so uh, my position is let the speech be had, let the American people, uh, let the American people be persuaded by it or not. And finally this, in a lot of the, uh, the arguments on my side of the table and on the reform side of the table, you need to listen very carefully because there is a subtext to many of these debates. And that is, I don't really like the capitalist message and the influence it has in the policy making, whether it's minimum wage laws, whether it's the tax bill that was just passed and, and whether that was a sop to uh, big business. This subtext about defunding the right or restricting the socialist in the 1950s or 60s, uh, they go back for a hundred years debate between capitalists and labor. And those people who want to micromanage the rules of speech often have an ulterior motive mm. about who's gonna get to speak and who isn't, and they make arguments about what will improve democracy's functioning by control of who gets to speak and who doesn't. And to me, the First Amendment is not the domain of a political scientist who gets to manipulate democratic activity like we do in a, a, a science project, and inputs and outputs. First Amendment means there's gonna be some rough and tumble and there's, there's going to be some ugly speech and there's going to be some inequality in speech. But again, I come back to the American people can sort all that out. Well, you've just opened up a much longer conversation <laughs> that unfortunately we can't have. But we're going to, uh, I want to give everybody a chance to just make some brief concluding remarks, but I'm going to arrogate to myself about 45 seconds since uh, Jason mentioned Thurgood Marshall a few minutes ago to give you my, uh, my favorite, if that's the right word, political what if in American political history. Thurgood Marshall retired from the Supreme Court. Does anybody know when? 
August of 1991, there was some discussion at that point, things weren't, weren't quite the way they are today, but there was some discussion at that point that, hey, maybe you shouldn't have retired, maybe you should have waited to see how the next election turned out. Uh, but he didn't, he was ailing, he felt like going, it wasn't quite the fraud issue then that it is now. Do you know when Thurgood Marshall passed away? January 25th, 1993, Bill Clinton's fifth day in office. Bill Clinton would have appointed his successor. Take that home and think about how different the entire history of the last 27 years would have been if he had stayed on the court. Now, <clears throat> uh, last fast question. If we reconvene in 10 years and discuss the 20th anniversary of Citizen United, what are we gonna be talking about? Should I? I'll yeah. go. Okay. Um, first, thank you all for coming and staying. I hope that we're going to be talking about solutions that uh, Congress has come up with and that a president has signed to help alleviate the problems we're talking about today and different Supreme Court, maybe. But I think um, if I can just say, give, not speak to the question necessarily, I, think I will just ask. Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that people are engaged and questioning and challenging. The most important thing that we can do is not just be complacent and just assume things have to be the way they are. I love the asking of the big question, what is our theory of democracy? Um, I appreciated the nod to nonpartisanship, but that also um, iced out a couple of voices on the panel. So I'll just say that it's important. I think it's fundamental that wealth should not determine one's ability to have a, to elect a representative that is going to represent your policy preferences. It shouldn't determine whether a person can run for office and win. And when you look at the statistics, uh, you know, the um, women and women of color are a tiny fraction of candidates who run and people who are able to give money for historical reasons that I think we can all agree with. Um, so that brings us to a question of what can we do through laws and policies, maybe restrictions, but also affirmative reforms to try and bring the ideal of our representative and equal democracy uh, closer to a reality. And I'll just leave that. Well, thanks everyone, I uh, appreciate it. In 10 years, um, I hope we're talking about, and I think we will talk about, about how our republic was stronger than we thought it was, and that how uh, good people came together, which regardless of your political stripes, and uh, fought for a, a just and, and fair democracy that ensured uh, uh, an equal voice for everyone. Yeah, I'd build on that. Uh, this is going to be a noisy and crazy and uh, tumultuous election that we are about to be uh, go through. Uh, but I hope that we can look back uh, 10 years hence and say that this was not a low vo voter turnout election, that Americans engaged, because ultimately, I agree with Lee on this point, that American democracy is in the hands of voters. I've been a bit uh, called a bit Pollyannish <laughs> about this. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, new technologies may eclipse a lot of the concerns about the effects of money and Citizens United. Uh, the ability to register people, turn out people, organize people, speak to people uh, is be, uh, being uh, supercharged with technologies through the collection and use of data uh, and uh, through the ability to communicate low cost. And uh, the, high the days of high cost advertising are already waning. Uh, there are studies showing that they are less and less effective. And so I happen to believe that um, uh, there are going to be more and more uh, upstart grassroots candidates who are facilitated by new technologies and are able to do a lot of the disruption uh, that people were up here talking about and give uh, challengers uh, a fair shot at incumbents. Uh, and so I'm, I'm actually optimistic that technology will eclipse a lot of the rules and the problems we have with uh, spending um, that we're discussing. Let's thank this terrific panel and the American Constitution Society.